Hey everyone, my name is Tyler and I'm one of the pastors here at the Redwood Campus. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this teaching blesses you and encourages you and we'd love to see you sometime here in person. Amen. Well, thank you, Chris, uh, for that. And um, today we're in John 4, verses 27 through 42. And I'm going to read that here. It will not be on the screen this morning. Um, and I'm reading out of the ESV because I left my NIV at home. <laughs> Found this in the library. <laughs> John 4, 27. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming towards him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. I'm 13 years old. I've been praying for months for my best friend to uh, become a Christian, and he's agreed to come to winter camp, so I'm pumped, I'm excited. And so on the last night of camp, my friend prays the prayer of salvation, and I'm so excited. But as the months and years go on, it seems to wear off. The experience seems to fade. The one thing I prayed fervently for happened, and then it seemed like it didn't work. And I'm discouraged. I'm 23 years old, fresh out of Bible college with all the answers. And I start helping a small group of high school guys. And week after week, it feels like I'm not making any progress with them. It feels like I'm banging my head against a brick wall. Uh, After a couple of years, I get cynical and see a predictable pattern. Students become a lot more like their parents than their youth leaders. So I wonder, does all this investment make any difference? And I'm discouraged. I'm 31 years old. It's Sunday morning at 9, and I need to preach a sermon in an hour. I look at my notes and don't really like what I see. It's not what it could be. I get a brief glimpse of something, a thread that I think could be so enriching and helpful for you, the listener, but it's too late. I don't have time to track it down. There's simply not enough hours in the week to say what I want to say and how I want to say it. And so I'm discouraged. Have you ever been there? Not preaching half-baked sermons like me, but wanting to serve God, wanting to serve others, and it's not working. Maybe your prayers go unanswered. Maybe you're trying to kick an addiction, or maybe you're trying to help someone out of something Maybe people aren't showing up to life group and you just feel like you're spinning your wheels in the mud and you get discouraged. We especially feel this problem when we're working with people. People are messy and complicated. We have this saying, church would be perfect if there were no people here. (laughs) 
People are complicated. The work is never finished. I envy you contractors and plumbers and mechanics. You find the problem, you fix the problem, and you move on to the next problem. But of course, this oversimplifies things too, right? You have to work with people as well. Maybe you felt like the teacher in Ecclesiastes who said, therefore, I hated life because the work that was done under the sun was distressing for me, for everything is futile and a pursuit of the wind. Pursuing the wind, what a visual. So often our best intentions to help others lead not to fulfillment, but frustration and futility and discouragement. What should we do about this discouragement? In today's text, Jesus is going to give us three anecdotes to discouragement in ministry, three changes of perspective to what we're doing and why, and the last one in particular is going to change everything for us. Now, as a recap, last week we saw Jesus and his disciples make a surprising pit stop in Samaria. Jesus is exhausted and maybe a little discouraged. Remember, he put a successful ministry on pause due to some conflict with John's disciples and the Pharisees. So while the disciples go get food, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at the well. And to her great surprise, Jesus actually talks to her. They have this powerful conversation. By the end, she is transformed. She runs into town and tells everyone that they gotta go meet Jesus. Now, at this point in the story, the disciples roll up, John 4, 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, but no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? We talked about last week how strange this would have been culturally for the disciples to see Jesus talking to a Samaritan and and a woman at that. And so, The disciples, you know, as the woman runs into town, the disciples say, you know, Jesus probably needs some food. Maybe his blood sugar's a little low. We all get a little weird when we haven't eaten, right? So verse 31, Rabbi, eat something, they said. But he said to them, I have food that you know nothing about. And his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. So Jesus says, no thanks, I'm full. So the disciples think someone brought him food or water or Dutch bros. But Jesus says, no, boys, my caffeine is doing the Father's will. My food is to finish his work. Notice that his fulfillment doesn't first come from ministry success, but from ministry obedience, doing what God wants. So our first anecdote to uh, discouragement is, is this, namely that like Jesus, we are all ministers. We're all ministers. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a minister. <laughs> that word minister, diakonos, deacon, is where it means servant. We're all servants doing God's work. And what's God's work for me and for you? Simply put, it's the great commission and the great commandment. The great commandment and the great commission. So the great commandment, love God with everything. And love your neighbor like you love yourself. The Great Commission, go make disciples. Or in other words, help people find and follow Jesus. Now, how does our job description as God's servants encourage us when we're discouraged? In some ways, it takes the pressure off of us. He's the boss. I'm the servant. I don't need to have all the answers or I don't even need to be that successful. I just need to do what he tells me to do. It's kind of like having a personal trainer or a coach. There's this freedom in not needing to make the plan, a freedom in just showing up and doing what the coach says. And the long-term results are the coach's burden. Psalm 123, two, as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave looks to the hand of her mistress, so so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. It's this intense attention to what the master is up to. When we're discouraged, the psalmist shows us what to do. Lord, I'm watching your cues. Your every movement. I'm ready for you. And then to keep us humble when things are going well, Jesus offends us a little bit in Luke 17. Have you ever been offended by Jesus? If not, we're doing it wrong, right? Luke 17, after sharing the power of faith, uh, Jesus says this, when a servant comes from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No. He says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. 
In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. So obviously this illustration kind of offends us a little bit, but to put it in a modern example, imagine I get a great haircut somewhere. I might tip the barber, but I'm not like in his debt, right? I don't say, wow, I owe you big for this. I'm really in your debt. See, with his illustration, Jesus reminds us that our best service does not give us a claim on God. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. We are unworthy servants. So in encouragement or discouragement, I belong to him. I'm his servant. And there's great comfort in simply doing what he tells me to do, regardless of the results. But while this can be liberating at times, because God said so isn't always the most inspiring, is it? Parents, how long does because I said so work with your kids? Sure, when they're four years old, uh, because I said so is a shortcut for trust and obey me. But if your kid is 14, because I said so doesn't really work anymore, does it? See, because God says so, there is value in that. There is value in that, especially when we're young in our faith. But it's also incomplete and not the most motivating. So first, Jesus shows us that we're all ministers, but second, he shows us what we're doing as ministers, as servants, namely that we're all sewing. Now, if you're listening online, that's S-O-W-I-N-G, not like the knitting or or whatever. Sewing, planting. Uh, So from here, Jesus transitions from spiritual food to spiritual farming. Verse 35, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. So you're gonna have to trust me on this. I know it's hard to believe, but there was no Winco back then. Uh, No Costco, none of that. Um, Most food was grown locally. And so sowing is the hard work of preparation. You till the soil, you remove the weeds, you plant seeds, you irrigate, you fertilize, and then you protect. You do a ton of work on the front end with no visible results for months, but you believe that the harvest is coming. And if you don't plant, you won't prosper. Proverbs 20, verse 4, sluggards do not plow in season. Don't you love that word, sluggards? (laughs) So at harvest time, they look and find nothing. Be like me going out to my garden, saying, where's the watermelons? Where's the watermelons? I don't see any. But I didn't plant any watermelons. We reap what we sow. Have you noticed how often Jesus talks about farming? Uh, All over the Gospels. Maybe it's just because they're an agrarian society, using illustrations that the people were familiar with. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe there's something about the process of growing food That's a corrective to our microwave culture. We want fast food, quick fixes, rapid results, life hacks for six packs. You know what I mean? But then Jesus tells us, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. We want something in four seconds. But Jesus is telling us sometimes it takes four months, maybe four years, maybe four decades. Today, we're not really a farming society, unless you count pot pot farms, you know. But perhaps we might better understand compound interest. Maybe some of you have retirement accounts or do some kind of investing. Uh, Apologies up front for you financial advisors who have to listen to me try and explain this, okay? But compound interest is when you put money into an account, and then in time, your money makes more money, interest, And then that slightly larger sum makes money and the interest compounds. Makes sense, right? Uh, But the most significant thing about investing or compound interest is that it's less about how much money you put in and more about how early you start. Less about the money, more about time. So the fun example is this. Imagine I give you two options. Would you rather have $1 million today? Sounds pretty good, right? or a penny that doubles in value every day for a month. So let's say you take the penny. You're like, you know, Tyler, 
I'd like the million dollars, but there's got to be a trick here, right? You're a trickster, Tyler. So, um, so let's say you take the penny. After one week, you have 64 cents. You're like, oh, man. And then after two weeks, you have $81.92. You're like, oh, cool, but a million, you know? After three weeks, you have around $10,000. You could buy a decent car with that, right? After four weeks, you finally caught up with the millionaire man. You have $1 million, $1,300,000. After 31 days, with a doubling penny, you now have $10,737,418.24. If this continues for seven more days, you'd be a billionaire. Compound interest. To research more realistic examples, uh, just Google the difference between investing at age 25 versus age 35 versus age 45 and see the comparisons with those who start earlier versus those who start later. The key ingredient, again, is not money, but time. What a great illustration for ministry. Ministry, which we've defined as loving neighbor, helping others find and follow Jesus, this is a slow process. But it's the intentional investment of years that sees the results. When I was learning how to lead worship, I read something by worship leader Bob Coughlin that really caught my attention. He said this, we overestimate, we overestimate the impact of one worship service, but we underestimate the impact of a lifetime of them. We overestimate the value of one-time events, meetings, conversations, outreaches, thinking they will change lives. They might, but they probably won't. But we underestimate what a lifetime of these things in, done in love, can accomplish. I highly doubt this sermon will change your life. Or the music this morning, which we really appreciate the team. Or your life group meeting this week. They're more like a penny, aren't they? Uh, but decades of attention to scripture and singing spiritual songs together and decades of growing in Christ-centered relationships and love of, and service, uh, those pennies start doubling, don't they? There's this Chinese proverb you may have heard. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. But this idea of sowing requires us to take a longer term picture of things. My future and, and our future. I think of some of those old building projects like the York Minister Cathedral, for example. The construction took over 250 years. Can you imagine working on this thing your whole life, brick by brick, knowing that you personally will never see its completion? But it's not about you. It's about God and the generations after you as you joyfully lay brick by brick, knowing you just get to be a part of it. Some of you may know the story of King Hezekiah. The prophet Isaiah tells him the next generation will pay for his foolishness. And the king says, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, there'll be peace and security during my lifetime. Not my problem, says Hezekiah. That's not legacy thinking. King Hezekiah could have made sacrifices that benefited his children and his grandchildren and beyond, but he didn't so. He didn't sacrifice. He selfishly indulged and fearfully put his head in the sand. He didn't break generational curses and cycles and sins and addictions and the nation paid for it. Now, how about you? How about me? What are we sowing? What are we handing to the next generation? To our kids and grandkids? Have you ever seen your sins manifested in your children? I've heard it's terrifying. I think of me, and sometimes I see my sins in you guys or my, uh, you know, the, the things I lack. What kind of church will we hand our kids? Yes, of course, the physical location, and we're thankful for our facilities teams, thankful for you guys that give so that we can be here, but more importantly than the physical location is the spirit of this place. Right? Are we going to hand off a church that's known for love and service, sacrifice and truth? Are we going to hand off one that's angrily fighting culture wars or a church that's a comfortable club? Are we a hospital or a resort? 
Galatians 5, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So we have work to do and we shouldn't give up. Investing in the future, even if we're putting bricks into a project we're never gonna see the final completion of. Now, like our role as servants, as ministers, the role of sowing is somewhat encouraging. Even when we're discouraged, we sow knowing a crop is coming. But still, it's hard when we don't always see the results, isn't it? So let's talk about the third and most inspiring, the most exciting, I hope, part of this whole teaching, the paradigm shift. So Jesus tells tells us we're all ministers, we're all sowing, but we're also all reaping. Reaping is when you take the apples off the tree. When you take the grapes off the vine and make it into wine, the harvest is here. Fruit, abundance, parte. Amen? It probably makes sense that we as Christians both sow and reap. We plant and we harvest. But for the Christian today, what do you think is the percentage of sowing to reaping? You think it's maybe like 50-50? Or is it tilted one way or the other? Do we do more planting or more plucking? What does Jesus say? John 4, 35. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. And here it is in verse 38. I sent you to reap that which you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The scales are tipped towards reaping, aren't they? At least in this story, how much have the disciples done? Zero. They've done nothing. And Jesus is telling them to look at the ripe harvest, and he's probably pointing at the large crowds of Samaritans making their way towards Jesus. Remember verse 28, the woman went back into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And so they came out of the town and made their way towards him. And then verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, he urged them to stay. They urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his word, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The disciples have done nothing, and yet they enjoy this huge harvest of people turning to God. Uh, But this harvest didn't come from nowhere, right? Somebody sowed going to get that? (laughs) Jesus is calling, right? He's saying, do some sowing, do some reaping. So this harvest in Samaria didn't come from nowhere, right? Somebody sowed or some buddies. Lots of people plowed the ground and prepared it and planted seeds in Samaria. Think of all the way back to Jacob, a guy with a lot of issues, but he sowed seeds as one who wrestled with God. Think about Moses, responsible for the parts of the Bible that Samaritans actually read. Moses sowed seeds of scripture. Think of the unnamed spiritual leaders who led Samaria back to Yahweh and away from idols. Yes, their theology was incomplete, but these leaders left a legacy of loyalty to the God of Israel. How about the Samaritan woman herself? For all her problems, I imagine her seeking God, crying out to God, sowing seeds of painful prayer. And I think of the Holy Spirit keeping the flame of faith alive in Samaria. How about Jesus? In a culture prejudiced against Samaritans, against women, Jesus hasn't watered these animosities in himself, but has actively cultivated a love for outcasts and opponents in himself. Exhausted when he first meets the woman, he still does the careful work of cultivating her heart, planting seeds of faith for her. And then finally comes the harvest. Many Samaritans believe in Jesus as Savior. Verse 38 again, others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. And when we think about it, it's no different for us today. The hardest work has already happened. We take so much for granted. It's like when you're driving on I-5 and you drive over bridge after bridge after bridge. Imagine how much longer your trip would be without those bridges. We don't realize how much work has happened so you can make a quick Costco run. 
Similarly, think about how much blood, sweat, and tears has gone into uh, getting a Bible into our hands in our language, right? And now onto our phones. People have lost their lives so we could have this thing in English. And so now Andrew and I can debate on which translation is the best, right? People have died for us to be able to do that. Think about all the scholars and theologians who have gone before us working out the hard questions we now take for granted. Think about the first person to share Jesus with your ancestors or whoever in your family first became a Christian or maybe with you. Think about those who started First Baptist Church in 1890, found an old picture for us. This is River Valley Church originally, 130 years ago. Isn't that cool? 130 years of flawed people gathering together to look at Jesus, making it so that we could be where we are today. They made sacrifices and investments that benefit us here and now. Or we think of those who started Calvary Church here in the 80s and 90s so that we could be in this facility. Think about all the people who invested in me so that today I could be investing in you. Parents and grandparents, mentors and pastors and professors and friends and family members. Think about all the people who've invested in you so our church could reap the rewards of that, the benefit of that. I've only been here five years, meaning the majority of your spiritual formation probably happened somewhere else under someone else. And I'm so thankful for that. Imagine you had invested in Apple or Amazon 30 years ago. Or imagine if one of your great-grandparents had put money in a retirement account for you 130 years ago. You would be a multimillionaire today. But here's the cool thing as a Christian today. We have thousands and thousands of years of investment from the people of God and the Spirit of God. And we get to draw on that. The prophet Amos envisions a day in Amos 9.13. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows will overtake the one who gathers, when the one who crushes grapes will overtake the one who sows the seed. So basically the image here is things are growing so fast that the guy harvesting is right behind the guy planting who's right behind the guy harvesting. It's just growing so fast that they just cannot contain it all. And that day that Amos is envisioning is now. It's today. So many seeds that have been sown are starting to sprout today. Seeds that millions of God's people that they plugged away for years so that we could reap the reward. Do you remember that strange verse in John 14, 12, where Jesus says that believers will do greater works than him? Have you ever read that and gone, what in the world? Greater works than Jesus? I don't know about you. I've never walked on water. I've never raised the dead or uh, done anything like that. So what does Jesus mean that we'll do greater works than he did? I think Jesus means we'll do greater works in extent and effectiveness. So in extent, Jesus' ministry spanned a small section of the world for a short amount of time. But today, billions of Christians span the globe. If we're using a farming metaphor, Jesus is the apple seed, dead, buried, and sprouts, rises again in new life. And so Jesus is the apple seed, we're the orchard. We're spreading throughout every tribe, tongue, and nation. Think about all the acts of love and worship and service that just happened today from Christians all around the world, just today. Thousands, maybe millions of acts of ministry. Greater works. And then they're greater in effectiveness. Jesus' death and resurrection ushers in a new era of clarity and power that we get to partake in. Have you noticed that in Jesus' ministry, most people had hard hearts and confused hearts? But in Peter's ministry, Acts 2, they are cut to the heart and say, what must we do to be saved? This is not to take away from Jesus, far from it. Jesus is the dynamite that blows open doors of opportunity that we get to enjoy. Or think of what Jesus tells us about John in Matthew chapter 11. As John is in jail, Jesus tells the crowd, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. So pause. Out of all the heroes in the Old Testament that we read about, Moses, David, Elijah, Daniel, John the Baptist is greater, says Jesus. Quite the compliment, right? But then Jesus follows up with this next line, yet 
Even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. What does this mean? Are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? If so, you're in his kingdom. You're in the kingdom of God. Now you might say, well, I'm a pretty weak Christian. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The least in the kingdom. At the risk of being offensive, somewhere, there has to be the weakest Christian in the world, right? Someone's got to be it. Right? Somebody has to be the weakest, most foolish, most flawed Christian in the world. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. I don't know. But here's what's crazy. Jesus says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you're the weakest Christian in the whole world, you're greater than John the Baptist and everyone before him. And you're part of the greater works than John or even Jesus. See, the weakest Christian in the world knows more and has more than John. He knows more than John or she knows more than John. The good news of Jesus, that Jesus lived the life we should have lived but couldn't. Jesus died the death we deserved and Jesus offers forgiveness of sins based on his life and death for us. So the weakest Christian in the world knows more than John and the weakest Christian in the world has more than John. See, John could only talk about God, but you, weakest Christian in the world, you get God inside of you, the spirit. So friends, if you're discouraged this morning with ministry, with yourself, with the world around us, remember that we are in the midst of a great harvest that's been thousands of years in the making. We won't always see the fruit, but we'll get to see far more than anyone before us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. So one prayer I want to pray consistently, constantly this week, I invite you to pray this prayer with me, is Lord, where are you already at work? And I want to join you in that. Where have you planted seeds in someone's life maybe years ago that I get to be a part of and be a part of that harvest? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up and we're going to kind of sing a song that the bridge has that line to it. Like, Lord, where are you always at work? Um, but I'm going to read a poem for us by C.T. Studd. What a name, huh? <laughs> C.T. Studd, British pastor, missionary. And you'll recognize a line in it here. C.T. Studd writes this. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self, or in his will. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, we're blown away that we get to be in an era, in a time, in, in human history, in the history of the church, where we get to do a lot more reaping and plucking and enjoying and seeing the harvest than anyone before us. We confess with amazement and wonder that we are greater than John, even the least, the worst Christian in the world. Maybe some people here feel like that this morning. Lord, would they find encouragement in that because of what you've done for us on the cross by your resurrection and ascension, that we are in an era of clarity and power unlike any before us. Would help us to partner with you joyfully in the harvest, all of us of various spheres of influence, areas of our life where we can partner with you for that harvest. So give us eyes to see. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.